I got involved with our National Board for Quality and Training and led the, the group for training and then led the, the organisation for three years until a few years ago. And that consolidated my belief that actually every single colonoscopy uh, should be performed to a very high quality and can be. There isn't a reason why it can't be. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Indocast. I'm your host, Leslie Bishop, and this is episode 17 with our physician guest, Shuen Thomas Gibson from St. Mark's Hospital in London, England. Indocast is a GI focused podcast for clinicians by clinicians, presented to you by Boston Scientific. Together, we'll take a closer look at the data, techniques, and insights of endoscopy that matter most to listeners like you. Dr. Thomas Gibson, welcome to Endocast. Hi, well, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for asking me. I appreciate you taking some time from ESGE to come over and talk about your experience as an endoscopist. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear actually your story. How did you get into endoscopy? Well, it's a long story, but I'll try and keep it brief. <laughs> So oh, if it's juicy, I want all the details. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I try not to count the years, but I know that I did my first endoscopies back in 1996. And that was as I started as what we call a registrar in training. And that was at uh, St. Mary's Imperial College. And it was a struggle. And certainly colonoscopy, which is now, you know, what I do mostly, felt like a dark art, you know, you didn't really know what was going on inside the patient. And I attended one of the very first live endoscopy training courses at St. Mark's, where I am now, with some inspirational colleagues. And they unlocked that dark art, if you like, by being able to explain what was going on. And that's how I got into really specialising in, in colonoscopy. And then with a lot of support and encouragement, here I am a few years later, and it's what I do day to day. So what about even prior to that? What, what made you be interested in getting into endoscopy instead of a different specialty? I was a bit unsure what I wanted to do. Did I want to do intensive care medicine? Did I want to do cardiology? I was steered away is the polite way of saying it from, from cardiology because it wasn't a specialty for women, apparently. Um, sorry, all this. I was. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> not, not at that time. There weren't very many women. And I couldn't think really, I could think of a hepatologist at that time who was a, a female gastroenterologist, but there weren't very many female gastroenterologists. And it was at a time when I wasn't really thinking about endoscopy. So I was encouraged to apply for the job and I got the job and, and I loved it. I think what I realized quite quickly was I liked doing a practical specialty so I enjoyed doing the learning the act of, of endoscopy prior to that I had in, really enjoyed intensive care medicine but you know the, the patients are asleep and you can't chat to them whereas <laughs> the way we do endoscopy in the UK the patient is awake enough to have a, a chat and the combination of those two things was a very appealing y'all are still doing it that way yeah They're still under conscious sedation well, about 40% to 4 in 10 of my patients have no sedation at all. What? Yeah, for colonoscopy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that painful? If a patient is anxious or having a colonoscopy for the very first time, I will usually steer them towards having conscious sedation. But a lot of the patients that I see are patients who, unfortunately for them, have to come back repeatedly for a surveillance colonoscopy. And if they know, you know what to expect and they prefer to have no sedation, they have no sedation. Okay. I mean, I was in the field for 13 years. I saw, I don't know how many colonoscopies. I've never seen a single person not be under sedation. That is wild. Well, you know, maybe come to the live endoscopy tomorrow <laughs> because I'm sure there'll be some who are not sedated. Okay. That is crazy. All right. Well, it sounds to me from what you're describing, you've had a lot of mentors that have sort of steered you down the path that's led you where you are. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that, the effect of mentorship on your career? I don't think that can be underestimated. And you know, it's no coincidence that we're here really, uh, you know, under the premise of talking about women in endoscopy. And as I mentioned, there weren't really many women in endoscopy. In my case, it was male mentors largely, but I don't think the gender of the mentor matters. It's somebody who encourages you and is enthusiastic about the subject, who gives you encouragement and whether that's just by teaching you in the room or by helping you with your career direction, that's really important. And speaking of women in endoscopy, this is something you and I had talked about before and I was really excited that you were open to chatting about the, maybe the perception that a lot of women have, it seems, that maybe going into gastroenterology, especially advanced GI, is not gonna be 
they're not going to be also able to have a family. And I wanted to see what your comments on that might be. Well, I can only comment about it from my perspective, obviously. And I've got three sons. Um, you know, they, they are uh, grown up now. The youngest is 20. So it is possible. But I was a trainee for a long time, for about a decade. And so I got to my consultant post much later than a lot of my male colleagues had. And I was fortunate enough to have uh, support at home in a number of ways to help look after the kids and so I had maternity leave sure and you have to make you know you have to make some choices you cannot do everything there'll be some things that you can't do but again I was lucky enough to be encouraged and able to follow something that I was really interested in and passionate about and supported to do that by my family and by colleagues. Okay I love that perspective because I do think there can be a lie that women are told that we can just do everything. And that's just not true. Nobody can do everything. No. But it sounds like you achieved the goals you wanted. It just took a little bit longer. Oh, yeah. I would be in music club one day and then learning <laughs> EMR the next day. You know, it's, um, it, you know, it was great. In fact, one of my favorite things to do with the kids was um, help at school. And I would be given tasks like sorting out the play money or something and that was wonderful because that's all I had to do you know without people coming in and asking me complicated questions it was a great balance it's not for everybody but it worked for me switching gears I I know you have a really big interest in quality and I wanted to hear what what sparked that I've talked about this publicly I had a mixed bag of trainers when I was starting out in endoscopy and I've already alluded to the fact that it's a colonoscopy is a difficult procedure to perform. It's a really difficult procedure to learn and it's an even more difficult procedure to teach. And I had some um, very, very good teachers early on in my career and I had some uh, less good teachers. <laughs> less, uh, less good. That's so nice. And it wasn't always that a less good teacher was not a good endoscopist. So you can be a good endoscopist but not a good teacher. But unfortunately, I did see quite variable quality of procedures. And relatively early on in my colonoscopy career, I had a really significant complication. The short story is that I guess I could either have given up at that point, um, in part because of the response or lack of support that I had at that time. What did happen was, uh, again, I was fortunate enough to come to the institution that I'm at now and saw how it could be done well with uh, very high quality and thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it like that. And that's sort of what started me off on that journey. And I, again, very lucky to work at St. Mark's, which was an institution that put colonoscopy very proudly as a subspecialty doing diagnostic colonoscopy really well. It does a lot more than just diagnostic colonoscopy now, but doing it to a very high quality was really important. Then I got involved with our National Board for Quality and Training and led the, the group for training and then led the, the organization for three years until a few years ago. And that consolidated my belief that actually every single colonoscopy uh, should be performed to a very high quality and can be. There isn't a reason why it can't be. Can you talk a little bit more about the Joint Advisory Group? What, what is the purpose of that group and what, what have they done in terms of affecting quality in the UK? So they're about 30 years old, I think, if I remember correctly. It was set up as a training body, really. And the reason it's called a Joint Advisory Group is that in the UK, like many other countries, it isn't just one specialty of clinicians that performs endoscopy. We have surgeons gastroenterologists, so physicians, now a huge population of nurse endoscopists and other um, professionals who perform endoscopy. So it's a joint advisory group because it had people from cross specialties and it was set up to look at a training curriculum, if you like, and to improve the quality of training in endoscopy. And then it evolved into accrediting units and it incorporates the, the patient experience, the safety in the department, the nurse education and the endoscopist training. And then there are, there are certification levels for all of those things. Okay, and has there been a, a measurable change or difference in the outcomes of colonoscopy from that group? Yeah, very definitely. So there was a landmark paper to our shame in the UK, really, auditing the practice of colonoscopy in the UK. And it reflected very uh, suboptimal practice in colonoscopy. I say to our shame, no other country 
um, had ever published similar data. This was because of the National Health Service, we have relatively easy access to sort of large data sets of information and can encourage large audits across different practices. So although we were very ashamed of the results, there was nothing to compare with. Um, and so when other countries in inverted commas said, well, that's terrible, you know, the response was, well, what does your country look like? You know, they didn't, they couldn't say. Anyway, that was re-audited uh, over a decade later and the results had remarkably improved. So it wasn't a quick fix. Okay, well, that is amazing because you were the chair of that committee, were you not? I was for three years, but, so... um, but not, not right at the inception. That's still amazing. Those are amazing results. I actually want to circle back to something you said a couple of minutes ago when you're telling the story about the complication that you had. What was the response? Because you said the response was very bad. And I'm wondering, is that something that's common in GI where complications are, are ignored? That's a very long answer to this. <laughs> so I think the two consultants that were my consultants, they thought they were being supportive by sort of, you know, rubbing my back and saying, there, there, it happens to everybody. It won't be the last time. But they didn't know how to support me. There wasn't blame. I wasn't blamed. But it was actually a lack of supervision. Uh, there wasn't standardized training. Endoscopists were left on their own when the boss kind of thought you were okay. People were often left, trainees, doctors were often left to do procedures perhaps that they you know, weren't ready to do. But so they thought they were being supportive, but they weren't. And it was a time before it's a long time ago. I've been doing this for quite a long time. But before, there were governance um, structures in place, but there, there wasn't the analysis of a case as there is now. There is a much more open culture about looking at errors, medical errors, and how the team are supported, and obviously the patient and the patient's family, but how you, you know, prevent things from happening again. And that's another big area of the work that I've done is around safety and human factors and improving it from a non-technical skills approach. You've obviously dedicated a lot of your time to improving endoscopic training. So I'm just curious what advice you have for young endoscopists who are trying to expand their skills. Don't narrow down too soon. So endoscopy is a huge specialty. Um, you know, it's it's one of the biggest organs in the body. And so there's there is interest throughout and you can be uh, a very, very good, high quality, high volume diagnostic endoscopist. Or you can do what is essentially surgery, really, if you're doing, you know, upper GI POEM procedures or ESD anywhere in, in the gut. And it's largely about knowing your personality, because if you're risk averse, then you're not going to really want to learn those uh, those more uh, technically demanding procedures or not so much technically demanding, but risk associated procedures, ERCP, for example. Take your time to get as exposure in as many endoscopic fields as you can, work with different clinicians and find you know, um, find your tribe, as they say. You know, even within gastroenterology, there are different personalities who are interested in different areas. You may become interested in academic endoscopy. And then when you have found what you want, you go for it. And um, if needs be, you get your elbows out and you, um, you know, you say, look, I'm interested in this. And can I come visit? Can I apply? Have you got a fellowship? Get your exposure travel, go and visit units outside of your own unit in your country or in another country, get the experience, come to meetings like ESGE or the American meetings or the Euro other European meetings, go to specialty meetings. And once you've decided where you want to be, then you throw yourself into it. All right. Now, talking a little bit more about your particular specialty, I'd love just to hear your thoughts on how you prepare for the best end-to-end -end polyp polypectomy. If I know I'm going to have to do a significant polypectomy on a patient, then I'll have wanted to meet the patient and talk it through with them. Ideally, even if another doctor has seen that patient, because we all have a different approach and we all handle it differently. And I want to know about the patient, the risks of the procedure to them need to be explained and understand all the sort of their comorbidity and who lives with them at home, all of those things. The fact that they really shouldn't fly long distances for two weeks after the procedure. Those sorts of things need to be explained to a patient. Then, um, you know, when it comes to the day of the procedure, 
The next thing I'll do before the patient's walked into the room is brief the team and make sure that we've got everything that we reasonably can plan for. My nurses will tell you that I always ask if we've got clips in the room before I say, have we got a snare? Because I don't want to be given a snare unless I know I've got a clip to sort out bleeding, for example. So those are some, not all, but some of the non-technical, if you like, factors. And then, of course, there's a toolkit which will include all of the things that I would need, you know, during a polypectomy. Okay, so you mentioned cold snaring in there, so I just wanted to see your thoughts on that and where you see that going. Uh, well, I mean, I've seen it evolve. You know, when I started off doing endoscopy, we didn't ever do cold snaring. You did hot biopsy for small polyps and you did hot snaring and there wasn't really cold snaring. Then we started doing cold snaring, but with the wrong sort of snare and it was a bit messy and it didn't really work. And then some of the dedicated cold snares came out. And I would say, actually, for the vast majority of my scoping, say on a bowel cancer screening list, for the vast majority, I will only use cold snare. I scope a lot of patients with serrated polyposis, for example. It's mostly cold snare, even if it's big polyps. It's very, very safe. It's very fast. And you get very good um, radical resection rates with it. So I think it will be used more and more, but there will be a limit. There will be a limit. But the more screening that we do, quite rightly, it will be used more and more, but it, it has to be used correctly, you know, and I think there's something, for some reason, endoscopists are a bit shy about taking some normal mucosa. With cold snaring, you have to take normal mucosa. So you, you, want, you want to take, uh, you, make, you need to make sure it's a radical resection. Okay. Now let's talk about EMR. What advice do you have for physicians who are referring patients for EMR? Firstly, take very, very, very good pictures. So we were talking earlier about cameras and you know, gone are the days where you had a camera and you took pictures of your holiday and you came home at the end of the holiday and you were really disappointed because actually only five of the 20 photographs were in focus and the rest of them were blurry or there was a thumbprint over them or the sun was in your eyes. It's exactly the same with endoscopy. So if you take an image of the polyp and you can't see it up close or there's stool in the way or it's slightly out of focus, I don't want those photographs. I want your best holiday photographs. And I want uh, a bird's eye view. I want to see it from a distance so I can see the whole thing in relation to the bowel wall. And I want some zoomed up you know, wrinkles, all the wrinkles I want to see on a polyp, okay? <laughs> so it doesn't matter how wrinkly it is, I want to see every single wrinkle. And I want to see it in white light, and I want to see it with some form of digital enhancement, whether that's a, a, a digital enhancement or, um, or a liquid dye spray, for example. That's the first thing. Then I want you to describe it with the well-known classification. So what's the shape of the polyp? What is the uh, kudo classification? So what do you, what's your estimate of the, the wrinkles, if you like, the surface pit pattern to describe, which basically translates into the degree of dysplasia and how advanced the polyp is. And then again, some listeners will know we developed something called the SMSA tool, which is uh, stands for um, site, morphology, size and access of a polyp. And that gives a score that tells us how difficult the polyp is likely to be and gives a clue as to how long you will need and also correlates with the risk of complication. And so I want all of that information. And if you're not familiar with those scoring tools, the SMSA, the KUDO, the Paris classification, then just use clear words backed up by your best holiday photographs. I love that analogy, that's so fun. All right, so let's talk about a challenging resection. What are the factors that make it challenging and how do you, how do you work with these, how do you manage these factors? Again, I mean, that's you know, a whole afternoon of talks in itself, <laughs> but to mention, and I'm sorry to plug it because it is our, 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 we described it, but the SMSA scoring tool will tell you. So a bigger polyp is more challenging. A very flat polyp is more challenging or a very huge bulky polyp that's filling the lumen, even if it's benign, is very challenging. The right colon tends to be more challenging because there's often some looping or scope instability. The stool is often not cleared as well. And then the A in the SMSA is the access. So polyps that are very close to the appendix or on or coming out of the appendix or the ileocecal valve or involved with the diverticulum 
or at one of the uh, flexures, the splenic flexure or the hepatic flexure, or right down low at the dentate line. Those are all features of a polyp that's never been touched before of making it challenging. So full stop, all of those will make it more challenging. And your approach will differ according to all of those. There are techniques that you can use. So for example, you can, if I know that there's a polyp involved in the icicle valve, I'll use a transparent cap or, a, or an endo cuff or something to help bring it into focus or into position. Some of the basic techniques we'll use, position change, for example, will help with that. If you're going to need to look at it in retroflexion, if it's behind a fold or on a flexor, then you may want a, a floppier instrument. So there are all sorts of technical factors for a polyp that's never been touched before that you can predict if the referring endoscopist has given you the information that you need. Some of the other factors that make a polyp challenging is if it's previously been attempted or it's a recurrence of a polyp because it's stuck down, it's scarred and stuck to the deeper tissues. Let's move on to complications. Mm -hmm. I want to know about the ones you, you're obviously encountering during polypectomy or EMR and what are your steps to address those complications or to prevent them? I much prefer prevention. <laughs> I'm all about prevention. So having a um, properly uh, counselled patient, not so much consent, but a counselled patient, so they understand how important clean bowel preparation is, for example. They really understand if they have to stop anticoagulants, for example, when they have to stop them and for how long for. And, you know, we have had incidents where patients think they've stopped their anticoagulation, but actually we're not sure that they have because oh, they're, <laughs> they're confused as to whether this little white tablet is the anticoagulation or this little white tablet is. That's all, the, again, the non-technical factors that are really, really important. If you encounter a complication, so let's take bleeding. Um, you know, it's one of the most common complications that you would come across. Again, having the team set up at the beginning and having the appropriate accessories that you need to manage that can't be overstated. And keeping with the basics, so if something's bleeding and the polyp is in front of you and it keeps being hidden, the bleeding point is hidden by the blood that's pooling, change the patient position. And that's the beauty of having a lightly sedated patient is that you can just say to that patient, can you flip over? And they'll flip over in often very, very quickly. Whereas if it's a fully anaesthetized patient, it can take a bit longer. Of course, there are other advantages to having a fully anaesthetized patient. So some of the basics about positioning the patient and having kit planned and ready to hand is really important. Actually, visibility is the most important thing with most complications, but certainly with bleeding. And treating it quickly and effectively will hopefully allow you then to complete the resection and then not leaving the uh, the scene, if you like, without being sure that the bleeding has stopped. In the worst scenarios where bleeding is torrential and you feel that you have to abandon, putting a clip very close to, even if it's not on the site of bleeding, is helpful because then at uh, radiology, the, ra the interventional radiologists can see roughly where the bleeding is coming from or even quite close to where the bleeding is coming from. So rather than panicking and just taking the scope out, try and get something metal on close so that your colleagues can, can find the site. And sometimes people will tattoo for the same reason, so that in the very worst case scenario, they have to go to surgery. The surgeons can see the site where the bleeding point is. Okay, my final question for you. I'd love to know how you see the future of polypectomy. So I would hope that in maybe 10, certainly 20 years, we will be doing much less polypectomy. Because if bowel cancer screening is effective and reaches all of the population uh, early enough, then we will be detecting and removing polyps at a much earlier stage. Uh, you know, obviously one day there may be something that even prevents polyps, you know, whether that's something as simple as aspirin or some other drug, certainly in patients who have a high risk of polyps. But the flip side is there will always be patients who come with polyps. Of course there will be, you know, that it's not a utopia. So there will always be polyps to be tackled. But, uh, you know, already, even in the period of time that I've been doing colonoscopy, polypectomy has evolved, both in terms of, as I've already said, most of the polypectomy we do now is without diathermy, very, very safely and effectively. And at the other, you know, at the other extreme, we're doing essentially surgery of uh, early cancers or precancerous lesions. We're also doing a lot of hybrid procedures with our surgical colleagues. And so um, it's a specialty that's got a, a really exciting future. 
And I don't know where we'll go, but I hope there'll be more women doing it. <laughs> I love that. That's a good, that's a good uh, thing for us to finish on. So thank you. Thank you for coming today. It's been really, really interesting. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Indocast. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow Boston Scientific Endoscopy on our Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn feeds. You can also visit our virtual education platform, EduCare. That's E-D-U-C-A-R-E dot bostonscientific.com and choose gastroenterology. The site features over 180 resources, including physician-led educational videos, lectures, case studies, device training videos, procedural tips, and techniques. Thanks for listening. Endocast listeners, an important disclaimer. These materials are intended to describe common clinical considerations and procedural steps for the use of reference technologies, but may not be appropriate for every case or patient. Decisions surrounding patient care depend on the physician's professional judgment in consideration of all available information for the individual case. Boston Scientific does not promote or encourage the use of its devices outside of their approved labeling. Case studies are not necessarily representative of clinical outcomes in all cases as individual results may vary. Thank you.